Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And don't worry, I'm not going to tell you about my research on DNA looping and its influence in transcription and gene regulation. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about is uh, the teaching that I do here on campus, uh, which is our effort to, uh, I teach thermodynamics which, uh, and kinetics and other chemistry topics, which tend to be a little dry for people. And so this is my effort to contextualize all of that for, you know, for the audience that I teach to. I learned that word from uh, one of my students. Um, so uh, is this, uh, let's see, there we go. Um, and I, I, I put too many words on the slide because it's sort of a model for what I put on the screen when I teach, although I also use the blackboard a lot because if you don't use the blackboard, it turns out, People just lean back and watch the movie, and, and pretty soon they're asleep. So, uh, but actually, I'm seeing pretty good open eyes here, so that's good. So why do, you know, why do I think chemistry is worth teaching? It is the central science. That's the advertisement for chemistry, but it really is true. It connects to physics. It connects to biology, engineering, material science. Um, any science that you can think of connects at, at, as directly to chemistry as it does to any of the others. Um, and within chemistry, uh, Thermodynamics and kinetics are the, fundament the most fundamental ideas. So therm thermodynamics is the science of what can possibly happen and what, and, and what is the extent to which it can happen. And it's an extraordinarily general way of understanding the world, which is part of what I hope to bring across to students when I teach it. And then kinetics is much, much more empirical. Kinetics is about how fast does something happen, much harder to predict, less of an intellectual structure surrounding uh, kinetics. It just controls everything that actually does occur, not, not just what can occur. So it's important, but uh, not, as, not as fundamental to how I view the world. Um, we teach thermodynamics. It, it touches everything, everything that happens in the natural world. Everything that happens in technology is really controlled by thermodynamics. And so that's a reason enough to study it, but what's really remarkable about it is it arises from a very, very small set of very simple and abstract principles. And so the effort in, in teaching this material is first of all to teach the material to get, get people through the MCATs, and then to convince them that even if they're not taking the MCATs, it's still worth learning, and then to show them the fact that there really is an amazing intellectual structure behind this. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is go through some examples, and I've sort of formatted the slides differently. This is, the, this is a slide I made for this talk, and then the slides that are differently formatted are, are, are from the actual class. Okay, so the problem with teaching chemistry, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times people have said, oh, I had a bad, bad chemistry teacher in high school and I hate the topic. It's happened to me, probably half the people I've ever spoken to have told me that. Um, so, this is, I'm not going to badmouth anybody who, who teaches chemistry differently the way, than the way I do it, but I'm trying to give you an idea of how one can do this, and as students, how you can choose to engage with a topic that is not necessarily what you really uh, intended to be spending your time in. And if you choose to engage with it, it really can be transformative. So I teach a course for non-majors, uh, Chemistry 271 for anybody who wants to sign up. Prereq is organic chemistry. Um, but, uh, so I, I, I teach, um, yeah, uh, so why do people take this class? I, I, I always ask them to raise their hand in the beginning. And the answer is somebody has told them that they have to. Uh, either a medical school or a dental school or a farm school or, or it's their major. Now, so, so clearly, you know, the people who make these rules know that this is important. What, so what do students want who are forced to take chemistry want from a chemistry class? They want it to be predictable. They want it to be not too hard. And they want it to be safely isolated, siloized, so that the minute my class ends, they can forget all of it and not worry about whether they're going to take this knowledge on to biology or biochemistry or medical school, because that would be a lot of responsibility. Uh, I, 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 sorry, I'm being a little sarcastic there. Um, and they tend to be unhappy when this isolation breaks down. So I get a lot of complaints about, I'm, I'm, you're teaching biology. It's like, no, I'm not. I'm, te I'm not teaching biology. I'm, t I'm teaching applied chemistry. And because it has some connection to what you think of as biology, you think I'm, I'm, I'm uh, exceeding my bounds somehow and escaping from the chemistry silo. Um, but the point is, 
Thermodynamics is an incredibly general way of seeing the world. And if people are willing to engage with that and create a framework of knowledge into which they can fit, fit facts and equations, uh, it, it can be a really powerful way. I mean, everything, every, everything I do, I'm thinking about the thermodynamics of driving to work every day and uh, uh, where the water heater in the shower is coming from and what my solar heater on the roof is doing and all of that. OK. So it's really our job as, as science educators to convince people that what we do is worth doing and that it is a good way of, of seeing the world, of understanding the world. So uh, this is, you don't have to read everything on here. Uh, this is a, an example of a, a quote, you know, a slide from my class. I tried to be honest and literally just pick stuff out of my PowerPoints. Um, and the point of this is that you can read this quote from Albert Einstein. You know, here, here's the guy who turned uh, physics in the 20th century completely upside down, had, had, had no uh, preconceptions whatever about whether the received wisdom out there in the world was correct. And even he said that within its domain of applicability, which is pretty much everything, uh, he didn't think that anything he could do could possibly turn thermodynamics over, that it was, it was absolutely solid. What we teach today, what I teach today, is a combination of the classical thermodynamics that he thought was immutable and also stuff that he added to it, uh, the statistical aspects that he added to it. Um, so uh, it's a, we have it on good authority that, that, that uh, thermodynamics is a powerful way of seeing the world. So how do I contextualize this for the students? The first, is, the first thing, I'm going to give you a few examples of making connections to biology. Um, and in many cases, this is biology that people are either studying or that they're going to be experiencing now or in the future. So as an example, DNA hybridization thermodynamics underlies essentially all of genetic engineering, genomics, personalized medicine, uh, all of that. And it's just the idea, and I, I, I don't want to take the time to do class demo, do demos with bringing people in from the audience the way I do in class. Um, but it's the process of two DNA molecules coming together, and then you work with that double-stranded DNA, and then they come apart. And uh, you want those DNA molecules to come together where you want them to come together and nowhere else. And that's where the thermodynamics comes in. So. Uh, we cover examples that, that deal with all of this. The other thing is redox chemistry. So my class is nominally about thermodynamics and acid-base equilibria and redox and kinetics. So redox is oxidation reduction. It's taking electrons from one place and giving them to another place. And it turns out that with the exception of fermentation, which is a mode of life that's the moral equivalent of uh, moving the deck, deck chairs around on the Titanic, with the exception of fermentation, all life is based on taking electrons from one place, putting them somewhere else, and living off the fact that, that that's a favorable change. And so we can use these simple ideas to explain why fat has more calories than, than sugar. Um, and it is exactly the same thermodynamics that underlies the fact that oil is a better fuel than wood. I mean, there are a lot of reasons you don't run your car on wood. It's hard to get it through the fuel line. but. Uh, um, but it, the energy density of oil is much, much better than the energy density of wood because there are more electrons per carbon atom and they pack together better, and that's all thermodynamics. Um, why bugs distribute as they do in the soil and water? The idea there is that organisms that can give electrons to oxygen get a lot of energy out of food, but you get an inch or two down in the soil, there isn't any oxygen, you have to give your electrons to something else like nitrate or sulfate, you get a lot less energy back live slower, but you're surviving in a place where the aerobes can't. And so that's why we have life everywhere uh, down the water column and down, and down into the soil. So again, it's all about the thermodynamics, about who lives where in the water column and the soil. And finally, uh, plants have two photosystems. So they need that because they can't, they don't have enough, you can't get enough energy from one photon to do the two jobs that photosynthesis has. One job of photosynthesis is to make carbohydrates that we eat. The other job of photosynthesis is to rip electrons out of, uh, out of water and give us the oxygen atmosphere that we breathe. And then our job is just to recombine that and regenerate what the plants need to grow again. Um, OK, so here's a, an example of a slide on, on DNA hybridization technology. The blue box there surrounds one DNA bound to another DNA, and that's going to start, start a, a polymerase that copies it, and that's the basis of all of the forensics out there that's worth anything. I hope we don't have any hair and fiber analysts out here in the audience who I'm insulting with that. But uh, 
The forensics that really works, the Innocence Project and so forth, is DNA forensics, and uh, this is the basis of it. Um, redox reactions, I've gone over this. I just thought I would throw up one equation here. O2 plus 4 electrons plus 4 protons goes to 2H2O is the basis of how our metabolisms work. Um, and, uh, you know, that we, we've, we've gone over the idea. Many, many other connections between redox and the natural world. Okay. So what about the intellectual achievement? What about this intellectual structure? It really is remarkable how simple the postulates are. The postulates is that the universe evolves in a direction such that there are more and more microstates available to the universe as we move through time. A microstate is basically a way of arranging things. You can think of a dorm room in terms of there are a lot more ways to have a messy dorm room than there are to have a clean dorm room. And that's the idea of increasing entropy. Everybody knows this nebulous concept of entropy as disorder. It's basically the number of ways to arrange things. So that's a very abstract idea that then leads you directly to how do engines work and how, do, uh, how does metabolism work and so forth. So what I do in the class, because we just don't have the time to cover this incredible uh, uh, you know, intellectual journey, uh, is I take the shortest possible path from this uh, idea that the entropy of the universe is always increasing, uh, the shortest possible path from that idea and the idea that that's where we have a, you know, that's where time comes from. Time moves in one direction because entropy is always going up. Um, the shortest possible path from there and very simple examples about ha how energy distributes among particles to these rules that govern how the world works. And uh, I don't expect, I, you don't have to remember this slide because the symbols are, aren't contextualized completely. But the goal is to get the students to this slide, which is essentially how you solve problems, and then teach them how to solve problems as quickly as possible, just to give a flavor of, of this amazing intellectual structure. OK. So connections to the sciences that they know, uh, connections to uh, uh, this intellectual structure. Um, and I'll explicitly try to make connections to movies and books and so forth, you know, The Matrix and Gattaca and Heinlein, uh, he uh, Tonstoffel, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. That's the first law of thermodynamics. Um, and the uh, Somerset Maugham wrote a, uh, wrote a book called The Razor's Edge. And in this book, there's a passage where he's, he, 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 he addresses the audience directly. And he says, I'm now going to describe a conversation that I had with the hero of the book over breakfast. And this is going to take a couple of pages. It's not going to move the story along at all. So if you want to skip it, just go ahead and skip, skip forward a couple pages to where the action picks up again. But just be aware, if you do that, that the reason I wrote the book is to describe this conversation. And so why should I teach people how to solve certain simple types of problems and not where any of it came from? Uh, I feel like I'm cheating the students if I do what many of the textbooks do and just lay out the equation that you plug into. Uh, and I think many of the students appreciate this. So in the end of the class, I show them where we've been and why. Uh, and uh, going from blue, these fundamental ideas, to green, which are the problems you can solve uh, easily, to red, which are all these technological implications. And then finally, the other thing I try to do is connect to the real world, uh, batteries and cars and things, but also uh, global warming. Because this is the big problem that we face. If we don't solve this problem, none of the other problems that we face matter. And people have talked about, you know, this morning, talked about ways of making this, uh, you know, having attitudes that help protect the world. But besides attitudes, you need technologies. And so thermodynamics tells us that corn ethanol is just not a good way to save the world. Uh, the, the thermodynamics are not there, and there are many, many other environmental problems with that. It tells us that carbon sequestration is a good idea but that it's hard. And it's just now beginning to work, and it's not clear whether it will scale. And uh, one of my favorite examples is it tells us about the hydrogen economy. And the big thing about the hydrogen economy is the hydrogen economy might, might be really important, but not because there's a lot of hydrogen in the ocean. That's utterly irrelevant to the hydrogen economy. Uh, the problem is that the, water, the hydrogen in water is not the right form of hydrogen, and it's the thermodynamics that turn it from water to H2, which you can burn in a car. So uh, we you know, bring all of those ideas. Um, and we can talk about why fracking, for example, 
is a matter that causes a lot of debate among environmentalists because it has or may have a lot of environmental uh, side effects that are not good. But on the other hand, it's a lot better to burn oil and natural gas than it is to burn coal in terms of global warming. And we know why based on the redox thermodynamics. So all of this can come out in one simple class. And uh, finally, we know we, all of the solutions to global warming, the technological solutions, not the attitude changes necessarily, but the technologies that are, are going to underlie the answers are all based on thermodynamics. All right. So uh, what are the results? Some people hate my class because I've exceeded my boundaries and I, they, they, they don't think I'm teaching what they want to learn even though I should know better. Um, so that's a negative. The positive is that students who uh, engage with this class become educated citizens of the world. These are quotes from C.P. Snow, who invented this idea of the two cultures of chemistry and biology. And uh, uh, not chemistry and biology, that's another <laughs> two cultures, uh, humanists and uh, natural scientists. And his specific example was people should know the second law of thermodynamics. OK. So the results are, I hope, that people come away ideally with a framework of knowledge, a lens that they can use to transform the way they see the world. And the other thing is they should be better informed citizens of the world whether or not they've enjoyed the class or not. Thank you very much.